When I was in high school in Batavia, uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, there was a radio program that had a very interesting concept. Listeners were supposed to call in and answer this question. If you were stranded on a deserted island and could only have four albums with you, which four would they be? Of course, I'm dating myself by talking about radio programs and albums, you know, but that was back when vinyl ruled the music industry. But the question remains the same. If you were stranded on a deserted island and could only have four albums with you, which four would they be? And I don't think my list has changed much since then. I think it still would include some Tom Petty and some Waylon Jennings, and you can uh, debate on the way home what that reveals about me, you know. But it's kind of a fun exercise to do. It doesn't have to be albums, it could be four books, which four movies, which four famous people, which four memories, something philosophical like that. So back in high school, my friends and I mostly listened to the program just to hear some good music and to argue about the choices that people made. But you know, looking back on it now, I wish we'd been a little more reflective about that exercise. Because in exercises like that, the choices we make can reveal an awful lot about who we are. You know, why did we choose those four, whether it's books or albums or movies or whatever? The choices we make in those kinds of things can reveal a lot about our interests and about our personal history, about our priorities, and about our values, too. In our Gospel today from St. Mark, Jesus reveals something about his own priorities and about his own values in what he asks his disciples to take with them, or not take with them, as it were, too. So he's sending them out in his name for the first time. And his instructions to them, the choices that he makes, contain some fascinating revelations for all of us, not just about Jesus, but about who we are as his followers, as his disciples. So first of all, as we heard, the disciples are not supposed to be weighed down with any unnecessary baggage. They're supposed to travel light, to trust that God's going to provide for all of their needs. Now imagine doing that. Imagine setting out on a journey that's going to take you away from home for probably months at a time and taking almost nothing with you. You know, typically when we're going somewhere for a long weekend, we can't fit everything in the suitcase that we think we might need, right, just for those three or four days. But disciples are supposed to travel light, take only the essentials. Jesus doesn't want us weighed down by unnecessary baggage. Secondly, once the disciples arrive at their destination, we're told that they're not supposed to move around from house to house. They're not supposed to hop from place to place. In other words, even the accommodations are not a priority for them. Disciples are supposed to be indifferent to the kind of house that they're staying in and the kind of food that's being served. Because the task that they're being given, Jesus' task, his mission, is far more important than even those basic necessities. Finally, we hear that they're not supposed to feel dejected or frustrated or angry if other people ignore them or ignore the message of Christ or reject them or even show hostility toward them. No, Jesus basically says, look, don't waste your time and your energy with folks who have no desire to hear the message, no openness whatsoever to the good news. Once you're aware that their hearts are completely closed, shake the dust from your feet as you leave. Because all disciples of Jesus have a task, again, a mission, that's too urgent to be sidetracked by those who obstinately refuse to listen. Of course, we can't force people to listen to the gospel message, can we? We can't force people to follow Christ. All we can do is share the message with as much love as possible. And then if they don't listen, well, then, as Ezekiel said in last weekend's scriptures, at least they shall know that a prophet has been among them. Now, on the positive side, Jesus sends out his disciples to actually do three things. He says, don't do these things, but do do these three things. Preach repentance, expel demons, and anoint the sick. And those things became their mission because, of course, that's Jesus' mission, those three things. What was the first thing that Jesus said, as a matter of fact, when he started his public ministry? The very first thing he said was, repent, for the kingdom of hand 
The kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, he's saying, look, turn back to me. Turn back to Jesus. Turn back to God. I'm always right here. I'm always right by your side. And I'm anxiously waiting for you to give me your heart and give me your life. So Jesus preached repentance, and so too must his disciples. The second item on Jesus' agenda, as it were, was to fight evil head on wherever and whenever he found it. And Jesus, of course, did that quite literally by casting out demons. In other words, what was he doing? What was the basics that were happening there? It wasn't just casting out demons, no. Jesus was freeing people from the things that enslave them, which made them less than human, less than they could be, less than they were created to be, things that prevented them from living in the freedom of the sons and daughters of God. And thirdly, after preaching repentance and confronting evil head on, Jesus goes after the consequences of evil, the consequences of original sin. He does that by curing the sick, by relieving suffering. Now, you know what that means for all of us, right? We're called to do the same things today, just as those disciples were sent out so many centuries ago. As baptized followers of Christ, we are called to do the exact same things. First of all, we're called to travel light in this world, travel light, not to be weighed down by the unnecessary things of the world, by our attachment to those things. Now, Jesus is asking us, too, to rely on God's providence. Obviously, we do our part, but we rely on God's providence, not relying on the false securities of the world like material possessions and worldly success and popularity and power and control and all that stuff and money. If those things come our way in this life, praise God. We try to use those things for his glory and to help other folks. But Jesus says, don't rely on them. Don't base your life on these things. Build your life instead on Jesus himself. Jesus is the only one who's unchanging. All those other things are transitory, aren't they? They're passing. You can't take them with us. So in your heart and in your life, Jesus says, travel lightly. Secondly, preach the good news. Preach the good news. It doesn't mean you have to stand on a soapbox. He's not asking us to do that. But just like the first disciples, we're sent from this mass, we're sent out like from Jesus, into a world that increasingly seems to have forgotten about God or ignores him or is sometimes outright hostile to God. And we're supposed to be prophets to that world. We're supposed to carry the good news with us. And like Amos in our first reading, maybe we don't feel terribly equipped to do that. Maybe we feel inadequate to the job. But the Lord asks us to give it our best shot nonetheless, to always share the good news with love, share the truth in love, to do what we can, however large or small, to bring people back to the love of God. So travel lightly, preach the good news, and third, cast out demons. Doesn't mean you have to become an exorcist. That's not what Jesus is asking either, right? But he wants us to work in our lives and in our society, beginning with ourselves, to cast out of the ourselves and our society all those things that enslave people. Addictions, lust, selfishness, false pride, injustices, or the hopelessness and the loneliness that so many people struggle with. Cast out demons. Cast out demons. And finally, heal the sick. Heal the sick. You don't have to become an exorcist, and you don't have to go home and register for med school. You don't have to do that either. But how do we heal the sick, you and I? Well, simply by showing compassion, by showing love to those who are suffering, those who are carrying crosses, the sick, the dying, the depressed, the grieving, the lonely, the unloved. It's simple to do, right? Hold a hand. Give a hug. Right? Provide a, a sympathetic shoulder. Provide a, a listening ear and a listening heart. Heal the sick. By doing those things, we do Jesus' work of healing the sick. Finally, you know, Jesus really emphasizes for us, too, that we can't do any of those things alone. There's no such thing as a lone ranger Christian. We can't possibly do it alone. Our faith will not survive if we try and do these things by ourselves. Jesus summoned the 12 and began to send them out two by two. So it's always a communal thing for us. What we do here, how we get nourished here, and how we support one another is vital to doing what Jesus asks of us. We can only work together in the Lord's service or not at all. 
There's no in-between. So travel lightly, share the good news in love, cast out demons, free people from what enslaves them, heal the sick, and do it side by side with one another as a family of faith, as a parish family. That is our task as disciples. That is our mission. And we need to get to work on all of that right now. Right now.